You are looking at the result of a lifetime of dreaming of a mid-engine V8 Beetle and just over two and a half years of development of that dream. We're going to have a look and see just how far Jean has come with this project and how far he still has to go. Welcome to episode 16 of V8 Stealth Beetle. <laughs> At the end of the last episode, we saw the dark blue 1972 body arrive, get stripped and sent off to the body shop. There, Hammy and his team set to work turning a tired old lady into a stunning supermodel, a process that takes around 200 man hours. And the result is, quite frankly, beautiful. A fully restored, original right-hand drive body, ready to receive her new chassis and running gear. While all this was going on, John and Pierre were in the workshop getting the chassis ready, which, if you haven't seen it before, is a custom-designed and built V8 high-performance sports car. An aluminium high-grade chassis with OEM suspension and an Audi 4.2-litre twin-turbo power plant. Something that will produce around 450 horsepower in a vehicle that ultimately will weigh less than a ton. Once back in the workshop, the massive task of mating the new body with the performance chassis and running gear starts. The last time we saw the car it was white and ugly, that was the development body. Um, this is a whole new level. Uh, what sort of things have you really been working on to get it to this level? So Doug, the, the big thing of course and the, probably the most exciting bit was getting rid of that big ugly white body and sticking on this one. With us now getting to a point where we are going to be using this car, it wasn't just held on with the odd nut and bolt, it's now has all these fixtures on and it's all sealed and what have you. And then as you can see, the fenders have gone on, which we didn't have on the previous car, the doors are on. There are lots of little things that must still be done. Like you can see the front windows aren't in yet. Um, the running boards have been sent away to be color coded, the same color as the car. We made specific running boards for the cars. Um, so yeah, there's bits and pieces, but it does look a lot more like a car. So a lot of these changes you're talking about are the, the mechanical side of things and the, the, the setting it up, but obviously, um, I know that Pierre has also been working exceptionally hard on the electrics, the electronics. When we were driving around the, the big ugly white beetle, um, we only had basic electrics in. Um, electrics so that we could start it, so that the fan switches on, all, all the bits and pieces like that, we had no light circuit, etc. But now that we've got a complete car, um, Pierre has been forced to to complete the electrics. So we have all kinds of bits and pieces in the car now that works proper. We even have a USB port for people with their cell phones. We thought of everything. Um, and then of course, you know, things are getting a bit more complicated now. Um, we have the ECU wanting to know no, more and more information. We have the speedo and, and rev counter, which is GPS controlled. All this stuff needs to be now finalized and completed so that that's going to be the recipe going forward in, in all the future cars. With any modern car there, are invariably two different types of looms. You have your loom for your lighting circuits, which is this one that's sitting in front of me over here. And then you've got your loom that runs your plant or your engine, which is this loom over here. On the lighting circuit loom, you have various standard parts. We've got very little space in the center tunnel where all of this must sit. So our relay network sits right next to the fuse box in the center tunnel. We have changed the area where we're putting the ECU from the previous development car. Uh, the ECU is now going inboard in the cockpit, so we've had to do significant changes on that loom and the way we wire it into the vehicle. So Jean, from, you know, from my layman's eyes, it looks pretty much ready to go. It needs some windows and maybe the windscreen wipers. But I know that there's a lot, of, lot more tweaking and fine-tuning and fettling and stuff that needs to happen now. Talk me through that process. What sort of things do we need to start working on now? Once you start driving it, 
there's a whole new dynamic. And what does the car do when you drive it? You know, yes, the car turns when you turn. Yes, it stops when you hit the brake, all those things. But there's a lot more to a car. It's got to feel right. It's, it's, you've got to come into a corner hard, turn it, and the car doesn't wash or the tail doesn't climb out. So, so what happened is the first time we drove the car, the immediate thing we found is that the car is a lot lighter than anticipated. Um, it's only 950 kilograms, so I'm not sure what that is in pounds, but the car is light, so we had to go down on damping and coil rate significantly. The car felt like a, like, you know, it was like a, like a wheelbarrow. It was extremely hard. So we brought that down and that's changed the car significantly. The other thing that we found is that the steering was too slow. Slow as in the amount of turns in the steering wheel before the car has gone the route you want it. And so, so the way to solve that is that we put in what's called a fast rack. So a much shorter ratio rack. So everybody thinks, yes, you just pull the one rack out, you put the other rack in. Not at all. We had to swap rack, but when we change rack, bump steer, tie rod ends, everything changes, steering column, the whole lot. So that was a very big change, which we hadn't, we hadn't anticipated. The third thing that we found is that the car has got exceptional power, incredible amount of power, and we've had to do some changes to the back to try and cope with getting that power down onto the ground and getting it to grip. So yes, um, the, the, I'm not going to say to you all the work starts once you start driving it, but there's still a significant amount of work to get her to do what we wanted to do. And all of those things obviously are very, very important. It's a whole package. I mean, you're talking of 450 horsepower in less than a ton. It has to work together. It doesn't help that you've got an incredible amount of power, but you can't really use it because the car scares you or the car doesn't, feel, doesn't make you feel confident behind the steering wheel. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Also, what we would like to accomplish is that when somebody wants to just drive down to the shop, it must be a comfortable drive. So it's a, it's a very fine, line between making the full race car and a user-friendly car. And we would like it to be a user-friendly car, but when you accelerate, it must really perform. Now, there might still be quite a lot of work to be done, but I'm afraid it's going to have to wait. There are some more pressing and urgent matters in the workshop. Behind me, Jean and Pierre are working flat out to get the first left-hand drive Beetle to Germany in time for the Old Timers Grand Prix at the Nürburgring in August. Well, that's about the end of episode 16, and it just leaves us enough time to have another look at the first V8 Stealth Beetle on the road. As she's not road legal yet, we can only take her for a short spin on private roads. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs>